Movement across membranes. This video is geared towards leaving cert biology revision and so we focus only on diffusion, osmosis and active transport. So this topic is all about how substances would pass through membranes, how they would enter and leave cells. Diffusion is defined as the movement of a substance from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. This can happen in gases and liquids and the particles that we talk about can be atoms, ions or molecules. This red substance is in high concentration and its particles are going to spread out towards an area of low concentration. There's going to be a net movement of these particles towards the area of lower concentration. They're going to continue to move towards this lower area until such time as the concentration is uniform or balanced. After this, they'll still randomly move about, but there just won't be any net movement in one direction or another. The most important thing to remember with diffusion is that it's a passive process. There is no energy used by the cell. It's the particles randomly moving about using their own kinetic energy. An example of diffusion is in the lungs, where oxygen diffuses through the air sacs, the alveoli, into the blood where it's picked up by the red blood cells. So what factors affect the rate of diffusion? Well, firstly, concentration gradient. The greater the difference in the concentrations, the faster diffusion will take place. Temperature. The higher the temperature, the faster diffusion would take place. Particle size. Smaller particles will mean a faster rate of diffusion. And the distance. The shorter the distance, the greater or the faster the rate of diffusion. Osmosis. Osmosis is defined as the movement of water from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. And it's really important that you know the definition and that it's word perfect. Osmosis, like diffusion, is a passive process. This means that it does not require the input of energy by the cell. In fact, it's a special case of diffusion. It's special because it only involves the movement of water molecules and that movement must be across a semi-permeable membrane. So let's look at osmosis in a little bit more detail. So here we have a glass vessel and we have the left side separated from the right side with a semi-permeable membrane. Only water molecules can pass freely through the membrane. The solute particles in pink, they're too big to pass through the membrane. On the left side, the solution contains fewer pink solute molecules. These could be salts or sugars. So it has high water concentration, low solute, so it's hypotonic. On the right, there's far more solute molecules, pink particles. So it has low water concentration, but high solute. It's hypertonic. So what we can see then is that the water rises on the right side of the container, the side that had the high solute concentration, the very salty or sugary side, but it had a low water concentration. So water moved across a semi-permeable membrane from a region of high water concentration to a region of low water concentration. So there was a net movement of water molecules towards the higher solute concentration or the lower water concentration. And that movement will continue until such time as things are balanced either side of the membrane. After this, there will be no net movement of water molecules. There won't be one mass movement of water molecules to one side. The water will just simply move evenly either side of the membrane. If you find yourself getting confused, just say to yourself, water will move from where there's a lot of it to where there's less of it, or water will move towards the salt or the sugar, towards the solute. So how does osmosis affect animal cells? Well, let's think of red blood cells. If you placed red blood cells into a beaker of liquid, so a solution that is isotonic, that means the concentration of solutes is matched inside and out of the cell. Water is going to move in and out of the cell, but there's going to be no change in volume. There's not going to be any net movement of water in one direction or the other. So what would happen then if you placed your red blood cells into a hypotonic solution? Hypotonic means lots of water, low solute concentration, so very watery solution. So what would happen to them? Well, there would be a net movement of water towards the solutes. So basically the solutes in this case would be in the cell cytoplasm. So there will be a net flow of water from the beaker into the red blood cells. And if too much water continues to move into the red blood cells, they can swell and burst. This is the reason why in hospitals you're giving a saline, a salt drip, and not one with just pure water. So what about if you place your red blood cells into a hypertonic solution, into a very concentrated solution? Think of very salty water. Water is going to move from where there's lots of it inside the cell cytoplasm to where there's less of it or towards the solute, the salty solution. So there's going to be a net movement of water out of the cell. The cells will shrivel, they'll get creases on their surface, and this is known as crenation. So how does osmosis affect plant cells? 
Just bear in mind that plant cells have a cell wall and they also have a vacuole with cell sap. So those two factors will feature. So if you have a plant cell and you surround it in a hypotonic solution, so this would mean less concentrated solution. So there would be high water and low solute. Water will move into the cell. So water is going to move from where there's a lot of it outside the cell towards the solutes that are inside the cell in the cytoplasm and in the vacuole. So there's a net movement of water from outside the cell to inside by osmosis. As water enters the cell, the vacuole expands and this pushes the contents of the cell against the cell wall. The plant cell is said to be turgid and it's the presence of the plant cell wall that prevents the cell from bursting. In contrast, when plants are placed in a hypertonic solution, so a more concentrated solution, that means low water concentration, water moves out of the cell, so there's a net movement of water molecules out of the cell. So the vacuole and the cytoplasm will lose water, the cell will no longer be turgid, it's classed as flaccid, and when most of the cells are flaccid, the plant will wilt. Eventually, in a more concentrated or hypertonic solution, the plant cell will lose so much water that the cell membrane pulls away from the cell wall. This is known as plasmolysis, and the gap between the cell membrane and the cell wall is filled by the concentrated solution. This could be reversed by immersing the cells or surrounding them in a hypotonic solution, for example, distilled water. Don't forget that plant cells can also lose water through evaporation, transpiration on hot days, and they can become flaccid as a result of this. You're often asked to define what is turgor pressure. So it's the pressure exerted by the cell contents pushing against the cell wall. And turgor pressure is what keeps plants upright because their cells are turgid. If you lose turgor pressure, the plant cells become flaccid. And plant cells maintain turgor pressure by taking in as much water as they lose. Osmosis is a short topic, but it's important because it covers how water enters plants and how it moves within plants. So it's important to know it. An important application of osmosis is in food preservation, the practices of salting and sugaring. For example, if you cover your food in salt or you add lots of sugar, like in jams, microorganisms like bacteria and fungi that cause food spoilage, well, their cells contain a lot of water. Water is going to move out of these fungal and bacterial cells by osmosis towards the salt or the sugar, towards the solutes. This ensures that they lose water and so they cannot survive in these conditions, they die. And this is the principle of salting and sugaring. Finally, we have active transport. This is another method used to transport substances across membranes into and out of cells. Active transport is different to diffusion and osmosis in that it is not passive. The cell must use energy for active transport. In active transport, the cells are moving substances from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. So transporting substances across membranes from where there is less of it to where there is lots of it. So this movement is against a concentration gradient. So that's different to diffusion and osmosis as well. Active transport uses ATP as the energy source and cellular respiration provides the ATP. So in cells where there's active transport going on, there will be many mitochondria. So what substance would we say is actively transported? Well, we could give the example of glucose. Some glucose is actively transported out of the nephrons in the kidneys. So that covers transport across membranes. It's a short chapter, but it's very important. Make sure you know your definitions of diffusion and osmosis. Be word particular for osmosis. Be able to explain turgor pressure. Know what happens to cells in more and less concentrated conditions. Really understand osmosis because you may get a graph question and they can be tricky. Be able to define active transport and know examples of substances actively transported. Be specific. So the best of luck with all of your revision. Remember, the only way to do well is to do past papers and to check the official marking schemes. And don't forget your textbook.